Actually, Brock, you could use that one for the closing hymn, but that's okay. It was just a starting one. In a commencement speech at the University of Texas, Admiral William McRaven challenged the graduating students as they were about to move on with their lives. If each and every one of you changed the lives of just 10 people, and each one of those folks changed the lives of another 10 people, in six generations, this class will have changed the lives of the entire population of the world, 8 billion people. That's an inspiring thought to leave with people setting out on the beginning of their journey in life. When I read these things, some things pop into my head. I think, how did they do? Did they do that? Did they listen to that? How did their lives go? How did, what did they accomplish in their lives, I wonder? This math, however, works the same when you apply it to almost anything in, in life. If people are starving somewhere in the world and you take them food, whoever's taking them food has to continue to do it over and over. And after a while, it becomes a huge task and even overwhelms people. However, if you take and teach one or two people how to do that themselves and they teach others to do the same, Soon you have an entire nation of people that are self-sufficient and able to take care of themselves and provide the necessities of life for them. Considering those university graduates, that was a challenge that the Admiral gave them, but not just for them. I use that challenge today for the church. We are to change the world for Christ and to make disciples of all nations per Jesus' command in Matthew 28, 18, and 19. He is saying that we are to change all groups uh, and nationalities of the world. That means we don't just change people, but we give them the means to change people as well. And everybody that we talk to and that is converted to Christ becomes a change agent for those that aren't in Christ. That is the power of generational multiplication. And that takes place when we all take seriously our participation in the work of the church, particularly in discipleship and evangelism. Consider the multiplication factor in evangelism. And sometimes I look at that and it kind of blows my mind. It may blow your mind too, if it's as small as mine and insignificant as mine is. If one person converted a soul every week, that would be 52 souls in a year. And if they did that for 16 years, they would have converted 832 souls. And that sounds pretty good. Except there's 8 billion people in the world. How's that going to work out? How effective is that? Now, consider this. And I'm going to make this very doable. If one person converted just one soul a year and discipled them to do the same, the first year there would be two souls, the second year there would be four souls, the third year there would be 16 souls, and the fourth year there would be 32 souls, the fifth year would be 64, and you go on like that, and at the end of 16 years you converted 131,000 souls. That's a few more than the 832. And you know what? A lot easier. Not so, not so much pressure and work. Multiplication converts um, way faster, converts people way faster than doing it by addition. And so this morning I want us to look at this multiplication factor as it spiritually applies to the church or as it applies to the church. In 2 Timothy, I better turn there. In 2 Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy, uh, right, he, he's his favorite boy there. He's a, his son in the faith. And so he's writing to him to encourage him. And in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, or verse 1 and 2, he says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
You see, see that there? You see the multiplication thing going on there? This here letter is the last letter that Timothy is going to receive from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul's in jail, and um, he he's, sees that his end is coming. And so these are literally his last words to his spiritual son, or his son in the faith. It's important, it's insightful, it's inspiring, and it's impactful. Paul knows his fate is sealed, and that he soon will be offered up. His death was imminent because of his faith in Christ. In, it, in this letter, you can hear the urgency. You can feel the passion that Paul has in his words as he exhorts and encourages Timothy to continue in faithfulness and service to Christ Jesus. You see, some had already fallen from doing that and, and separated themselves from Paul, partly because of his imprisonment and impending death. So Timothy is exhorted to keep the gospel message that he had heard from Paul. Nothing more, nothing less. He was given this message in the hearing of others, so there were witnesses that could attest to this being done. And then Paul gives him the most basic assignment of Christianity. Be evangelistic by entrusting or giving this message, teaching them, them t teaching people this message so that they can do the same thing. That's what he wants Timothy to do, and that's what we ought to be doing. And that process is just repeated over and over and over. Teach everyone in, in your sphere of influence, friends, families, co-workers, acquaintances, and anyone else that you might come in contact with who will be willing and able to continue to do the same with people that they know in their sphere of influence. And that is called evangelism. And it is multiplication rather than addition. Now consider for a moment that these are the last words of Paul to his dear son of faith, his companion in the work of the gospel, and his co-worker. Have you ever um, read or considered some people's last words? Or have you maybe considered what your last words might be? You know, some of us um, may not have the opportunity of controlling that factor, because we might be walking along thinking life's going great and it's over, you're done, you drop down dead. That could happen. And so you maybe don't have any famous last words. But there are some people that do. Steve Jobs' last words were, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. That was his last words. Poet Emily Dickinson were, I must go in for the fog is rising. And you can kind of picture in your mind what's going on there. Princess dies last words. My God, what happened? And she died in that vehicle. Pistol Pete Mar Marovich. <laughs> I don't know how many people remember Pistol Pete. But he said, I feel great. And then he picked up a basketball game. He was 40 years old and he collapsed on the court and never moved. Michael Landon, Little House on the Prairie, said, You're right, it's time. I love you all. And he died. Union General John Sedgwick said just before he died, They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And he said this to his Confederate, to his soldiers who were ducking bullets from a Confederate sniper. And you know what? One of those bullets got him. So it hit an elephant. Many people say the last words, but say last words, but none so powerful and so encouraging and passionate as those of Paul that he wrote to Timothy. Those powerful words we have just read in chapter 2 demonstrate these things. The broad view of this letter that he writes to Timothy also demonstrates this. If you look at 2 Timothy, the first chapter deals with keeping the fire burning, the fire for Christ burning. Chapter 2 focuses on keeping doing, keeping on doing what you have been doing. Chapter 3 focuses on continual perseverance in the face of trials and tough times. And chapter 4 focuses on pressing forward 
hard until you have crossed the finish line and gained the victory. And so this morning, let's look at how real this is for our lives and how it applies to our lives. One of the first things that we might want to reflect on in our lives and do this with honesty is where evangelism and discipleship rate in the picture of necessity to being, to being done. You see, um, we cannot dare to take evangelism and discipleship as simply an option for our life if we are in Christ. Like Paul told Timothy, we must also entrust this gospel that, that we have been giving to others, teaching them and training them in the truths of the gospel so that they can repeat the process and literally we could blow this world apart. If every Think about that. If every Christian did that and that continued to repeat, think about the numbers in the church and the kingdom. Too many times our evangelism stops at the person coming up out of the waters of baptism. But really, that there, that is just the beginning of a lifetime of service in the kingdom. Don't get me wrong. I want to see souls being immersed into Christ every day. And I know you want to see that every day, if, it, if at all possible. But the discipleship journey doesn't end there. The discipleship journey begins there. And that's important to realize. At times in Timothy's life, he heard the go- at some time, sorry, in his life, he heard the gospel message of Jesus Christ and salvation. He responded to it and was baptized into Christ. Now, we know that his grandmother Lois was a huge part of of his knowledge and faith in God. We are told that his mother Eunice was likewise um, important in his life in developing his faith. But on Timothy's journey to Christ, we also know that Paul had a large role in his conversion, and thus he became his beloved son in the faith. We, we may not know the particulars, all the particulars, of the who and hows of Timothy's spiritual birth, but we do know something that we can absolutely be sure of. We have the written word that proves that it didn't end when he came up out of the baptistry, but it began and it grew and became powerful from there. Paul is writing this letter because he's still discipling Timothy. One thing that Paul makes very clear in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2 is that Timothy was supposed to keep passing the baton that Paul had handed off to him. To faithful people who are able to teach others, and you can look around the room, and we could probably say, everyone in here, I pray that everyone is that faithful, and that we could say that about everyone in this room. Disciples of Jesus Christ are made when those new or old in the faith are taught the truths of God's word, led by example, and then are trained to transfer or to share that same word of truth to others who then again do that and again and again and again. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every single Christian's legacy included an enduring testimony of commitment to discipleship? Wouldn't that be something? Think about the multiplication that would happen and the possible numbers that could reflect could be reflected in the church and the kingdom growth. Long ago, long before uh, we had all these fancy fire trucks and all these firemen that are all beefed up and, and using all these tools we have and everything, we had something called the Bucket Brigade. And some of us probably remember the bucket brigade. What that was, was someone was standing at the water and filling buckets. And then you had a line that went to the fire, wherever the fire was. And the buckets got handed down the line. And that the lucky guy that was standing in the heat at the end got to throw the water on the fire and maybe pretended it cooled them off. I'm not sure. But, but that's how they did it. And, and you know what? Everybody in that line was important. They were important. If one missed, 
If the bucket got dropped halfway down the line, you didn't have water to throw on the fire. So everybody was important. And, and so a great way to start a gospel fire is for everyone to get in line and start making disciples that will make other disciples and the process will repeat itself over and over unendingly. For that, we need to believe. The word discipleship defines precisely what we should be doing in, succinct, in a succinct way. First, you receive Bible teaching and grow. And as you're doing that Bible, getting that Bible teaching and growing, you're reaching out to others with the gospel and you reproduce yourself through discipleship and then you repeat that for the rest of your time on this earth. Now I want to throw a caveat in here. I'm not talking about repeating who you are. I'm talking about repeating who Jesus is. They're a disciple of Jesus. And we're all discipling for Jesus. We're discipling them to be Jesus, not us. Because we're too flawed usually. The population of the world is somewhere around 8 billion people. And when some people hear that number, they just kind of check out. Um, and I think it's called fear of numbers or something. It's too big. It's too overwhelming. How are we going to save 8 billion people? Well, we're going to start one at a time. But how do we, how do we save that? And so people kind of just quit. Then we look at our numbers here. And we, we think, there is no way that this little congregation here is going to impact the world for Christ. But you know what? That's because you don't have faith in Christ. Because if you have faith in Christ, he can take one person and impact the world for him. Oh, he did that. Well, God did that, right? With Jesus. We can impact the world for Christ. And, but we, what we tend to do is we revert and every once in a while we might convert somebody, um, our own little thing and all of that. But if we will just hear and listen to what Paul tells Timothy, these things can change. Paul said, Timothy, focus on multiplying generations of disciples and the impact of the gospel will explode exponentially and the world can be one for Christ. So rather than fearing big numbers regarding the task of spreading the gospel, we should focus on the power in numbers as Paul taught Timothy. I, I wish I had a graph to show you, but I don't have a graph. So I will call on your memory, and I'm going to turn it around, twist it around a little bit from the introduction we had. If you alone convert one person per day for 365 days, and you repeat that for 16 years, you'll have converted 5,840 people. Not that many considering 8 billion, but you might have a notch or two in your belt. Now, we'll make it much more realistic. We'll make it much easier. And we'll just say, instead of every day converting somebody, convert somebody one day a year. And so you disciple them and you repeat the process and it keeps going and it keeps going. And you have the, um, whatever, uh, 65,536 souls converted. Now, let's make it just a little tougher. What if all of us just converted two people, one every six months to Christ? We, we were involved in sharing the gospel and they came to Christ. Those numbers would go up so crazy that it would turn out to be something like 43 million plus in 16 years. That's how the multiplication factor works. So if you are converting someone and discipling them to convert someone and that keeps going and that keeps going, that's a possibility. Scary thing is it can be done. The scarier thing is that most people think it can't and won't even make an attempt to have that done. But that is what we are called to do. The last thing that we must make sure we are right with 
is that we are grounded in the truth of God's word and that we are living that truth out in our everyday life. That is the only way souls are one and discipled. We must stand on God's truth and his authority over everything and anything. We must realize that the power behind evangelism is not us. The power behind evangelism is God, is his word, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4 and 20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. It's God's power. It, it isn't just gibberish or nonsense or someone talking silly. It is real and it is powerful. And John tells us to test the spirits and not to get sucked into the false teaching of those who would lead us astray to eternal death. And then he says something very comforting, something strengthening, and something encouraging to the saints. And it would be good for all of us to remember it. He tells them, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. And he's talking about overcome the false prophets and the false spirits. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We don't have to fear the world because we have God. It's kind of like David taking on the giant, right? The world's our giant. Don't fear it. Paul tells us in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We have the potential to do it. If Christ is in us, we have the potential. If God's power is in us, we have the potential to do it. With God, all things are possible. Yeah, not with us so much. But, and too often, we concern ourselves more with what God is doing than what we should be doing. Or what we think God might be doing than what we should be doing. So let's do our part and let his power do its part. And guess what? All things will work out to him being glorified. And then we got to live it. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we are promised the power of the word for our use. Paul writes, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So is there a work that we can't do? No, for every good work. We have everything needed to get the job done. And again, in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, Paul says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Do you have that spirit? He's given it to us. We shouldn't be fearing things. So the next time you feel inadequate or intimidated or flat out fearful of, in a given situation, remember that you have a whole lot more going for you than that other person has going for them. He also promises us that he's in our presence. He's always with us. Matthew 28 and 20, Jesus said, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We ought to carry that with us in our hearts. We ought to remember, when we're walking out there, are you thinking, okay, I'm, I'm walking down this sidewalk, are you thinking Jesus is there with you? Or maybe he's just a little bit out front leading you. That'd be even better, because that's where he should be. But he's there with you. And the last thing we have to remember is our position. Jesus tells us in Matthew 10 and 24 that the servant is not above his master. And again, he tells us in John 15 and 20, 22, that the servant is not greater than his master. So I've got, if, if you're thinking that way, I've got bad news for you. You're not better than your Savior. You're not greater than your Savior. He's great. He's awesome. In all things, we have to remember our position in the kingdom and Jesus' position in the kingdom and never get those crossed up. 
If we have that figured out, then Jesus can accomplish great things through us as we strive to do his will every day. The key to evangelism is sticking with it and never quitting or giving up. We are always encouraged to persevere to the end in Scripture. And so we should all strive to be like the Apostle Paul, who coming to the end of his life here on earth could say without quivering, without fear, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Will that be your epitaph? It should be. Jesus tells us in Matthew 25 and 23 in the parable of the talents to the servant that pleased him that did the things according to his will he said well done good and faithful servant we are all servants of God we must all strive to hear those blessed words from the mouth of God our Savior they will be like sweet music in our ears John MacArthur ran track in college he was the third of four to receive the baton and, and, it, and then they would carry on, they would run their stretch. Well, he got, it got to him and he cut, grabbed the baton and he walked off the track into the infield and he sat down. And everybody's freaking out. He wasn't injured, so what happened? Well, John MacArthur decided I just don't feel like running anymore. And so he went and sat down in the infield. Teammates, coaches, fans were all disgusted with him. Didn't you know that, don't you know that you represent the school and you represent your coaches? And How could you let everybody down? How could you destroy everything in just one mad moment of selfishness and self-centeredness? But he quit. Brothers and sisters, we are in the Lord's church and we represent the Lord, we represent his kingdom, we represent his love, his good news, and we must take that to the lost and dying of the world. The message here this morning is not to not be that one that walks off the field and quits and gives up. We must always be running the race and passing the baton, and we do that through discipleship. So do your part, let God handle the rest, and let's win the world for Christ. If we can help you with evangelism and discipleship, let us know how we can help you with that. And if um, you need to obey the gospel call this morning, we want to help you with that as well. So you can let us know what we stand and say. In the name of the